to the second part of the talk uh, why is history important for teachers uh, i am grateful to megha ji for helping us organize this i am very grateful to professor romila thapar for taking out her time and sparing her saturday afternoon for us uh professor thapa needs no introduction to my students her name is synonymous with the uh, excitement and intellectual excitement towards history knowledge in history i belong to the generation that read the textbooks written by her in school and my students belong to the generation and that read history textbooks written by her students uh professor niladri patacharya professor kumkum etc so we all are connected uh, through knowledge and by being intergenerational teachers uh professor thapar is also a unique uh, historian in the sense that she is a public intellectual uh, she has been writing on issues she has been raising her voice so uh she raises uh, she poses a big challenge to the idea of armchair social scientists and we have benefited from her very scholarly work in history and also from her uh, public writing so i uh, welcome you ma'am and i request you to take proceed with the session as you wish to so we can start mega ji straight with uh, part 3 uh, or section 3 of the questions yeah. then we can come to why history is important for everybody later okay um is professor thapa here she is having problems with her ah she is here okay all right so i shall go straight into um the set of questions that were left out the last session um so we begin with uh, what did you find more difficult as a history teacher to imagine and theorize yourself how things were in a distant past or to make others imagine that through your writings and classes um and the next one in this section is is history really a dynamic body of knowledge if yes why did it become so boring in our country so over to you professor thapa i like that second question um <laughs> good afternoon everybody um let me begin by saying that i really didn't imagine the past for anybody neither for myself nor for anybody else i imagined the past as being a rather complicated business which i should first understand myself and then i should try and explain it as best i could to others um i don't think i imagined the past very much i tended to stick to the sources and i kind of repeated what they said but in the course of sticking to the sources and repeating what they said i did ask questions and i think that is a very important uh, issue which i will come back to again and again until you're bored to death with hearing this but when you read a text don't just read it as you read it imagine you're talking to the text and you ask it questions keep on questioning what it says it's terribly important to ask these these questions um history was in fact a bit of an abstraction therefore i didn't imagine very much the people i was dealing with or the events that were happening partly because we don't really know too much about that we know a little bit but we get to know much more about the environment and the background and the context as we come into the modern period and there are more and more sources that tell us that but for early times you have to imagine it somewhat and this is where the problem arises because some people stick to the sources and say i cannot imagine the situation and there are other people who let their imaginations fly and they describe the situation with very little reference to the sources 
So that distinction is something which is very important and which really separates the historian from, uh, from the general public because the historian is supposed to refer everything to the sources that he, and she, he or she are consulting. Whereas the general public can tell stories and narratives and, and, and get away with it. What I did try and do was to try and visualize some of the people that I was writing about. You know, one, for example, when I was doing my book on Ashoka, Ashok Maurya, um, I did try and think of what he might have looked like. Um, especially in one or two texts when they said he was very ugly. And I wondered what the form this ugliness took. But nevertheless, um, it is something one was thinking about. Uh, but of course, uh, in the early days, we don't have visual repre representations of, of kings and uh, so much, except, of course, in the Northwest, where the coins that were issued on the Greek model did carry some portraits of the rulers. Otherwise, none of them did. I mean, um, Indian coinage and Indian representation of the rulers is very, very scant. It's very difficult to, to get any kind of actual picture. Um, there are two um, uh, plaques from a stupa in South India, the, the Kanaganhari stupa. Um, with uh, scenes depicting Ashoka going and worshipping the Bodhi tree. And the inscription says, uh, Ihe, Asoko, uh, Rayo, and so on and so forth. And you know that the reference is to King Ashoka. But it's not as if he's particularly identifiable. He's like everybody else. He has the same kind of face and stance as all the others who are there. So portraiture is not something that, that um, Indians were very keen on. And it's only later on that you begin to get it, um, for example, amongst the Mughals. Um, but this is very much, I think, a Central Asian fashion, which was picked up in India. But it's an interesting question, an interesting historical question of uh, why was portraiture not popular, and when does it become popular, uh, if it ever does? Now, your second question about uh, if history is dynamic, why is it so boring in our country? Um, interesting question. I would say one obvious answer is that the teaching of history is still, unfortunately, under the direct control of government. And when I say government, I mean any government, not necessarily the present one, but even earlier ones. Whether this is in, is in the form of school textbooks, using textbooks that have been cleared by the government, or even curriculum in the university, because remember that the Academic councils and the University Grants Commission are bodies that control curriculum and therefore have a control over what is being taught um, and what is being read. Now, why am I saying that this is unfortunate? It's unfortunate because, you see, if it was in the hands of historians, one could make an appeal to historians and say, let's liven it up a little bit and let's talk about other things other than what is of central interest in terms of the ruling groups in a country, central interest to authority. Let, let's talk about ways of living. Let's talk about clothing. Uh, some of the textbooks, for example, that were, re, that, that were written uh, in, in 2005, uh, to replace the ones that we had written, were extremely interesting. There were chapters on cricket. Why did cricket become such an important game in this country? And there were chapters on clothing, fashions, extremely important to historians. But you would never get that in a curriculum which is controlled by government agencies. And sure enough, when these books came into um, circulation, it was these kinds of chapters that were objected to uh, by people 
in, in government. Um, let's not forget, of course, um, I mean, who, who constitutes the government? It's run by administrators and politicians um, who, by the time they become responsible administrators and responsible politicians, by and large, with, with some exceptions, there are exceptions, I'm not saying this for everybody, but by and large, they do become rather boring people. They're so used to the routine of administration and they're so used to the routine of governing that they don't shift left or right. Uh, they don't think beyond and think of interesting ways in which to convey knowledge. Nor do many of them have the time. In fact, by and large, most of them. Uh, nor do they have the time to keep up with the latest technological developments that make a subject interesting. Um, for example, I mean, if you're teaching archaeology, let us say, it would be very useful if uh, once a fortnight you showed a film of the excavation of a site that you've been talking about. We all know every, every textbook begins with the Harappa culture, the Indus civilization. It would be nice for students to see a film that takes them round Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, the sites as they were excavated, shows them pictures, extensive pictures of what comes out of these excavations and that kind of thing. That kind of visual information where it is available of material culture becomes an extremely important asset to understanding the nature of what you're dealing with. Our problem actually is that those that very often sit on these committees to control curriculum, uh, very few of them read up-to-date books. Their knowledge of the subject goes back to the time when they were students, and that's usually a good 30, 40 years ago, and consequently, it's a little out of date. Uh, another reason for it being boring is, of course, that um, History has become an important subject for competitive exams. Everybody that wants to sit for the competitive exam, a uh, competitive exam to, to, to get into government service uh, opts for history because it's regarded as a mark scoring subject. You get good marks in history if you get it right. Um, and so from school on, there is this obsession, not with understanding what history is all about, but how do you get marks? How can you get marks? And this is a sure bet. The moment you start thinking of a subject as being a subject that is going to score marks and you take it for that reason, you lose interest in the subject and the subject inevitably becomes boring because all you're interested in is A, B, C, D, E, F. I must get these points right because then I will get 20% out of 30 or whatever it is on the score. So that is one very major reason why it's become consistently boring. Uh, most politicians, not all, again, there are exceptions, but most politicians treat the absence of knowledge as perfectly normal. They really don't know very much about what to do with knowledge. Um, and so they're not bothered with making sure that the knowledge is up to date, that it is uh, questioning knowledge, that it is knowledge that conveys new ideas and, and leads you to think. Remember that we are unfortunately no longer living in the times of politicians such as Gandhi and Nehru and Maulana Azad and so on. Um, who read a lot and who made excellent use of their terms in prison to read and write. I mean, they were put into prison for a year, two years, three years, and they spent their time educating themselves. I'm not saying that all politicians should go to prison, therefore, but what I'm saying is that there is a difference between those that read and write and are therefore inclined to think about things and subjects, and those who simply do not. The, there are these two categories, and we have to be aware of them. Now, a similar kind of thing has crept into the media. Uh, 
And I do have problems with a lot of the media, whether it is print media, and certainly the visual media uh, suffers from this a great deal. Uh, the majority of the articulations of media are equally um, uninterested in, perhaps even ignorant of, intelligent history. Uh, for them, history is a presentation. It's a visual spectacle. It's a romance. I mean, if you can get hold of princes and princesses falling in love and kings falling in love with princesses and that kind of thing and build a romantic story, you're made. Or if you can get battles going between kings. But to ask sensible questions like, you know, what was society like in those days? What did ordinary people do with themselves? This the media is not really in interested in. Um, so you get these endless spectacles. You can predict what the characters are going to look like, how they're dressed. You can predict the architecture of the palaces and the dialogue, which is really what one can only call slightly flea-bitten in the sense that we're all familiar with it. They start speaking and you can actually predict what the next uh, conversation is going to be because it's, it's, it's like that. The same themes get repeated endlessly. And if they do venture into a new aspect of history, they're looking for either romantic spectacles or occasions in order to express prejudices against communities. There's always this underlying prejudice about someone behaving the way he or she was behaving because they belong to a particular community. Now, a really intelligent media, if our media were intelligent, an intelligent media could take the boredom away from the public view of history by presenting historical events that encourage thoughtfulness, that in a sense tickle your thinking, make you think, make you ask questions, show you possibilities where you sort of say, oh, was it like that or was it like that? Why do you say it was like this? And why do you say it was like that? And that kind of thing. A questioning of the past, which is absolutely crucial, that is totally lacking in the presentations that are made by the media and indeed in a lot of the textbooks that, we, that, that are used generally. Um, it would be possible for the media to present history in new and interesting ways, but it tends not to do so. Now, despite this negative treatment of history, and it is negative, there's no other word for it, um, in, in the public sphere, it is still possible to make it interesting in schools and colleges and universities. And if it becomes interesting in these educational institutions, then automatically the media will have to uh, attend to and, and provide a different kind of history from the one that they tend to do these days. Um, how is it to be made interesting? It can be made good and thoughtful. Um, and again, it's a question of one can use resources other than just the textbook. I'm not suggesting that you encourage students to sit in front of whatever it is, the media, because that's uh, usually like the textbook. Basically boring, but then boring perhaps to some of us, not to all of you who as students are watching it. Uh, but you can you get documentaries, for example, on sites, on places and so on. And some of the documentaries are quite intelligently made and these could be shown much more often. There are books published. Uh, which, when they are intelligently written, make an interesting kind of backdrop to the reading that is happening. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we have very much in mind when we took up our perspectives in making courses uh, in history 
at the JNU because we tried to make them interesting and challenging. And we pushed the thinking to the point where the student had to ask the question, what do I understand by this? And that's a very fundamental question. You read a statement and the student should say, what do I understand by this? And discuss it with the teacher or discuss it with whoever is there. Um, so we talked about uh, different perspectives on, on the remote past. Now, this is really quite interesting. We see the past in a particular way. And we see it because we read our textbooks and we read other books and we watch films and we look at the media. That creates our image of the past. Think of a time when all this didn't exist, when people didn't have textbooks and media and, and films, etc. How did they think of the past? They thought of the past because the elders in the community would tell them stories and say, oh, this is how the past was. Now, the interesting question is that if you're, if you're listening, if you're a young person and you're listening to your grandmother telling you about the past, let's say in 1806, you don't have films, you don't have the media, you don't have textbooks. So she tells a story. And the question you have to ask is, what about the child who's listening to his, his or her grandmother telling a story about the same person or the same bunch of people in 1506 was it different and this is quite an interesting exercise in terms of projecting further and further back and saying what are the sources they would have used what would they have heard um, and and how would the versions have differed now i did do a little exercise on this um, where I took up different versions of the story of the Ramayana. As you know, there is the one standard version, which was written by Valmiki. But as most people don't know, there are many other versions written by other groups of people in praise of Ram, following the Ram story, but telling it somewhat differently. And the interesting thing is to track these versions to the time when they were written. So you have the Valmiki Ramayana, which is supposedly written around 400 BC or so. Then you have a Buddhist version, which is written around 200 BC or 100 AD, somewhat around there, which is a slightly different story where Ram and Sita are brother and sister. They're all banished and they go into the forest and so on and so forth. And, and the story ends up with them coming back to Ayodhya and Ram rules uh, from Ayodhya. But that little difference is quite interesting. And Sita is not kidnapped, by the way, by Ravan. She spends the 14 years with Ram in the forest and then they come back. So that's one slightly different version of the story. Then you get a version written by the Jains, the Paumacharyam, as it is called, the Jain version of the Ramayana, uh, which is again a little different. It's, it's more or less it follows the broad contours of the Valmiki story. Uh, but the perception of Ravan is different. He's actually not such a demon. He's a slightly nicer person. Um, and the reason why there is this conflict is also explained in other ways. Uh, the Rakshas are generally shown as not being quite as demonic and wicked and evil as they are in the Valmiki version. And that's a little later. That's about the 3rd, 4th century AD. So the point that I'm trying to make is that even when you didn't have books and there was an oral tradition, there was always this tendency that the major stories, the important stories, would be told with little additions and little changes. Um, and the historian then has to ask the obvious question, which is, why were there these changes? Why were changes made? What was it that a society was trying to say by saying, well, it wasn't quite like that, it was a bit like that. 
They're minor changes, but they are rather important. Um, so remember that when you're looking at the past, it's very important, A, to say, I am looking at it in the year 2021. Is this the same way in which earlier people looked at this past? And what information can I get of earlier people looking at the past? Which is, of course, available if you look for it. I mean, everybody says, oh, no, 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 you don't know, we don't know. But of course we know. People did express themselves. There are books, there are sources. And we need to look at them more carefully, more analytically to understand what they are trying to say. Um, so this brought in the question of looking at the past at different points of time and then seeing what the differences are. I then got also very interested in looking at the different types of literary texts, what we call genres, uh, epics, plays, poems, and so on. And following their histories and seeing how their presentation changed over time. And this is again where the different versions of the story of Ram become extremely important and significant and tell us a great deal about how people actually understood the story and what they, what they made of it. Um, um, it is therefore a, an effective way of discovering how change takes place and why change takes place. And remember, of course, that this is fundamental to the study of history. The historian is concerned with explaining the past, noticing the changes, and explaining why changes take place. So one plays a little bit with ideas, but basically one sticks to the sources. I think that's those two questions. Shall I go on and answer the others that were asked? Um, would you like me to repeat them or would you just? Well, um, would you, you like me to read them out or I, uh, would you like to just? Uh... Well, I, I could just refer to the, the main theme of the question. Sure. Um, yes. Also, in this connection, that a question was asked about does the present reshape the past? Now, this is, of course, a question that we're all battling with all the time. To what extent does the perspective of the present uh, shape the way in which we look at the past? It's a very fundamental aspect of historical research. Let me begin by saying that it was once thought that what were called historical facts spoke for themselves. All that the historian had to do was to string them together and put them into a chronological narrative. There you have your history. This understanding of history has now been discarded. Historical facts do not speak for themselves. They speak when they are asked a question and they make a reply. And since the question may differ, the replies may also differ. What is a historical fact then? It's not just any statement that you pick out of a text which refers to the past. The source from which it comes, the text from which it comes, has to be gone through and verified before such a statement can be taken as a historical fact. What do I mean by this? I mean that the reliability of the source has to be established. And this is where serious academic historical research plays a very important role. You cannot just pick up any text and say, oh, it says so in this text, so it must be correct. It, it says so, you, pay, you pick up any text from the past, past, you pick up the Buddha Charita or any such text, the life of the Buddha or something, and say, it says so in this text. But until you prove that the text is reliable, 
then you cannot say that this is a reliable statement. In other words, we historians are busy making problems for ourselves because it would be so much easier just to pick up a statement and say, well, it says so in the text, so we carry on with it. But in order to understand the meaning of the fact, it has to be placed also in historical context. That means you can't just pick out a statement and say, this is what it says and this holds true for all time. This is what it says for a particular moment of time. And you have to put that moment of time into the context of the society from which it comes and the moment of time from which it comes. So these are all important considerations. They're, in a sense, all important ways in which you judge the text. So today, History points to the significant events and personalities of the past. Yes, these are not just battles and rulers and so on. They cover a range of activities, and they are the reason why we describe the past having a particular pattern. In fact, the study of the past is today enormous. Specializations have become multiple because no one person cannot cope with the enormity of the data that is available. Now, some of these activities from the past have continued into present times. For example, we continue to worship icons. We, the way in which the icon of Vishnu and Shiva was made in the Gupta period is the same way in which it is made today, and it continues to be worshipped. Some uh, of our practices from the past have changed. For example, um, in Vedic times, there used to be huge sacrificial rituals. A vast area was taken up and a big altar was built and places specified, different categories of priests took up position. And very often these major rituals went on for 14 days or 28 days or whatever it may be. That doesn't happen anymore unless it is ordered. That is, you know, you may put it on as a scholarly attempt to study the ritual, as was done in Kerala in 1975, or some government may order it, who knows. But by and large, ordinary people don't put together these kinds of rituals. And some activities have become important in the present because they serve the purpose of the present and are therefore required to be remembered. One of the, the reasons why one keeps on asking, uh, why doesn't the attitude to caste change? And one of the reasons is that there is a continual rehearsal of saying, no, no, but in the past it was done in this way. In the past, this is what was remembered, and the Dharma Shastra is brought forward, and so on. And there is a deliberate return to the past. So remember that uh, historians are facing this all the time that either something stops happening, it breaks out of the pattern of culture and living. Or alternatively, there is an, an insistence on something by trying to justify it and say, it happened in the past, therefore it has to happen in the present. This does complicate the life of the historian very much, but it takes away from the boredom of history, for example. I mean, if you're forced, faced with the question that there is a particular activity that is going on, uh, being justified as having happened in the past, therefore it has to happen in the present. The historian has to then take a position and say, it did happen in the past or it didn't happen in the past. If it happened in the past, why did it happen? And even if it happened in the past, do we still carry on with it? Or do we drop it and change to something else? These are all questions that historians are concerned with. How do people in the present use the past? They sometimes use it to give themselves status, to do what we refer to in a phrase, to legitimize the present. 
the present situation needs legitimization, needs justification, needs somebody to say, oh yes, this is absolutely correct. And the easiest thing to say is, it happened in the past, therefore we're continuing with it. For example, uh, not so much today because it doesn't happen, but certainly in the medieval period, a lot of rulers got genealogies made for themselves, that is, family histories, ancestral histories, generations going back to earlier times. Why did they do this? You have inscriptions that begin with, you know, the, the genealogy of the family going back six generations. They mention each person and finally come to the present ruling Raja, whom they name and his activities follow. Uh, two reasons. One is curiosity. Who were our ancestors? We're always trying to find out who our ancestors were. Where did they come from? What did they do? Where did they settle? Etc. Etc. The second is that if you can claim an ancestry from the past, you get extra marks for social status. Somehow your status rises. You're not a newcomer. You're not a stranger who's just walked in kind of thing. You're somebody who is established over many generations. So turning to the past for this kind of information is one way of establish, establishing yourself in society. And often the rituals that are introduced into religious practices are said to have come from the past or from times immemorial. We don't remember, they're so remote, they go back into the past. This is in order to create a tradition and to claim the justification and the legitimacy of that tradition. But very often, rituals in particular are invented in the present. And this becomes uh, what this is called, what historians now refer to as the invention of tradition, traditions that are put together in the present. Historians in many parts of the world have worked on this invention of traditions, as in fact, historians in India have also worked on it. Um, this is done in various ways. One is if there is no basis, uh, if, if there is uh, the need to invent a ritual or an activity, you do it and you you justify it by latching it onto some narrative from the past. The other is a literal invention. And I think one of the most interesting inventions that I as a historian witnessed was in the last century, around the 1960s to the 1970s, the invention of a new goddess. I don't know if you have heard of her, Santoshima. She suddenly became very popular uh, around Delhi, Haryana, UP, Rajasthan. Little, little temples came up, uh, gatherings, bhajan singing to Santoshi Ma. Um, I was fascinated because there is absolutely no mention of her in the texts that talk about all the deities. Uh, no basis in the texts, but there is a mythology then comes up. She is the daughter of Ganesh, we are told. Where is this written? No, we don't know where it's written, but she is. That is the story about her. Um, I think if I remember correctly, there was a bubble in his head and she came out of that bubble or whatever it was, but she is the daughter of Ganesh. And her rituals are particularly attached to the time of Rakshabandhan very important. Um, and she is given an iconography. She has two arms generally, sometimes four, but she's given to the, the items that she holds, the objects that she holds, her stance. And there's a whole story about her life and uh, where she grew up and how she was recognized as a deity and the role that she played in the lives of 
other people. Now, this is a very interesting use of the past for the present. You want a deity like that. She was a deity that particularly um, appealed to, to traders, trading groups, and so on. And she was invented. And I remember there was an absolutely huge film made about her, Jay Santoshima, uh, where it was fabulous. They would show the film in cinema houses and people would get up and start singing the bhajans in the aisles of the, of the rows of seating and so on. It became a kind of ritual within a cinema house, which was really quite fascinating. And all of this is an invention of the 20th century. And one can see then how the past is being very deliberately used from mythology to rituals, to bhajans, to stories, to statues, to icons, to temples, the whole works. Um, so the historian always has to ask this question. What I'm studying, the ritual that I'm studying, or the activity that I'm studying, not just ritual, the activity that I'm studying, is this an invention of tradition? How far does it actually go back? And why was it invented? The why question is fundamental. In the writing of history, therefore, there's uh, now also a topic which some of us have specialized in, and you might have heard of, called historiography. The writing of the history of history. What we study in, in historiography is who is writing history? Who are the historians? What is their social background? What is their intellectual background? Uh, what are the kinds of questions they're asking? What are the kinds of sources that they are using? And how does the writing of history change from period to period? You have elements, a few occasional elements perhaps, in the writing of the epics, uh, though we're not sure how much of the epic is actually historical and how much of it is, is imaginative. Uh, then you come to the Purans, which have a little section known as the Vamsha Anutarita section, which is historical. It's the genealogies of dynasties, dynasty after dynasty is described. And then you get the Charita, the historical biography of rulers, which is largely historical but has little bits of imagination here and there. So, Historiography involves the way in which historical texts are put together, who is writing them, and for what purpose. Now, like every historian, um, the individual historian has his or her little bias. Sometimes it's a little bias. If they're conscious and aware of it, they control it. Sometimes it's a huge bias and they're totally uninterested in controlling it. They will carry on writing what they think is history with the bias. But the good historian is easily recognized by the fact that the bias is minimal. And, and the good historian is aware of this and therefore is trying all the time to say, you know, this is this is my bias but of course sometimes the bias is used to propagate distinct ideologies and that is one of the things that we have problems with at the moment where you have uh, two types of nationalism running parallel yeah. there is the secular nationalism of the national movement for independence, the nationalism which brought us our independence, which was democratic and it was secular. The two qualifying characteristics, the uh, adjectives by which this national movement is described, is everybody is equal, all citizens are equal, there is complete social equality, and the purpose of this nationalism is to 
support the welfare of society where everybody is socially equal and there is social justice. And there's the other kinds of nationalism, which in our case, for example, we had two varieties of what we call religious nationalism. Uh, one was the Muslim nationalism, which kept arguing that uh, picking up on the colonial interpretation, religious nationalism is deeply rooted in the colonial interpretation of Indian history, which was that Indian history consists of two nations, the Hindu and the Muslim. So you had Muslim nationalism that kept saying, we want a separate nation because we are a nation historically. And they got their separate nation. The Muslim League worked towards it and Pakistan was created. And now you have Hindu nationalism also saying that India should be a Hindu nation, the notion of Hindu Rasht. Now, it's important to recognize that there isn't one type of nationalism. There are quite a few. And the major types that have determined our history are the two I spoke of, the secular democratic nationalism that made of this country a nation state, and the religious nationalism that split the country into two nation states and that is now trying to make India into a Hindu Rashtra. Um, and the difference, of course, is the secular element and the social equality, the democratic element. Uh, in religious nationalism, it is the religion of that particular community which has priority in everything and in secular nationalism, all religions are equal, are treated equal, have exactly the same rights. So this is a very uh, fundamental difference. One of the ways in which this difference is expressed is that the Indian nationalism of the secular democratic variety Referred, for example, if you read the histories of the 1930s and the 1940s, which none of you will, uh, they always refer to the Gupta age as the golden age. This was necessary. Nationalism always looks back to a golden age, the utopia, the ideal age. And the intention is that the present should come as close as possible to this ideal age where there were advances in philosophy, in science, in literature, and in the arts. And the post-nationalist historians often criticized these views and said that, you know, this is an exaggeration to refer to one age as the golden age, because we had other ages with similar advances. The Chora period in South, Eastern, uh, South Indian history, for example, was a golden age. The Mughal period in the history of India was a golden age, and so on. What we have today, however, with the rise of religious nationalism, is that no other age is golden, but the forefront, the most important priority, is to be given to periods when Hinduism was dominant. So what we have today is the claim um, that there were many inventions and periods uh, where the Hindus were superior to the modern West. Inventions that we tend to laugh at, and in one sense they're laughable, but I think that they have to be seriously countered. Um, the claim that we had aeroplanes at the Pushpa Viman in which Ram Sita and Haruban traveled back to Ayodhya from Sri Lanka was an aeroplane. Uh, the fact that babies were born from stem cell research, the Kauravas, for example. 
or that we had television which enabled Sanjay to describe the battle of Kurukshetra, although he was miles away from it. There's even talk about uh, having had space travel. Now, the reason why these views have to be seriously contested is that they are anti-rational and anti-scientific. Anti-rational because they are not based on what I was talking about earlier. The sources are not consulted. The sources do not give you the evidence to make these claims. Uh, where is there a description of an aeroplane? And what little descriptions exist if you put them together as a model, that model cannot fly, obviously. The second thing is that with all inventions, technology, human knowledge, there is an evolution. It begins in a simple way, then a bit of information is added on, then another little bit of knowledge is added on, the activity changes, then another little bit, and finally you get to a product which also undergoes change. Um, if you take aeroplanes, for example, I mean, starting off with flying on the backs of large birds, which might have been the imagery of the aeroplane, you had aeroplanes. And you, the aeroplanes, those of you who've looked at the history of aeroplanes know that over the last century, they've changed in form and structure as they've gone along. And today, with space travel, you have a different kind of a machine that travels through space. It's not just an aeroplane. So what I mean is that there's an evolution of knowledge. That evolution is recorded and should be recorded. Where it is not recorded and you simply say, oh yes, we had that invention, you're really talking uh, nonsense because the record is not there to explain how you had that invention nor can that invention be repeated. All inventions that are genuine can be repeated again and again, again can be reconstructed. So there is a difference in the kind of history that is written in the context of secular democratic nationalism and the kind of history that is written purely for the purpose of giving priority to a religious or a linguistic or an ethical majority. And this is something that you as young historians have to keep in mind uh, very much. How does one deal with distorted history, which is often shown on the media? It's a long battle, it's a difficult battle. Uh, we are nowhere near winning this battle because most people would still like to believe these fantastic ideas that are projected in the media. But one has to go on insisting that the imagination and the fictional imagination is one thing. History is based on rational evidence and analysis. It's a totally different thing. The two have to be kept apart they cannot be mixed up. And it is always very important to keep this difference in mind, to explain this difference to people who tend to mix up the two. That, I think, was the last question in that section. So, Megha, back to you. OK. <clears throat> um. That was a lot of ground covered. And uh, I think uh, uh, this takes us to, if I'm not uh, mistaken, the very first section, right? Um, which is what we had started with the last time. Um, why is history important for all teachers irrespective of their subject specialization? How can we bring history into the classroom while teaching other subjects? It's very important because we are, there's a lot of talk happening uh, in certain circles about interdisciplinary form of teaching. Um, 
so it would be nice to hear about this and um, your views on the approach to the teaching of history in the classroom. Um, from there, we move on to the other set, which says, what is evidence in history? How do you judge the reliability of a source in history? If history is scientific, why is perspective so important in it? We know that studying the past helps us to understand the present, but should we not also study the present? to understand the past better and what history should an average citizen learn and what history should be taught at the school level to Indian children. That's a lot of questions together. Questions, yes, you're cheating. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, no, a lot of them you have already addressed. I yes. think only um, main is that by history. By history. Yes. How much yes. history? Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll stop me when you think that's been talked about. That I won't do. I just don't want to strain you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why is history important to all teachers, to all students, to the public at large as well? Um, I have a simple answer to that, which is that everything has a history. History is one of those subjects that applies to absolutely everything. Whatever you touch, whatever object you touch, has a history. When you talk about emotions, uh, dramatic situations and so on, they too have a history. Literature has a history. Thoughts have a history. Um, consequently, in some ways, history is the foundational way in which we approach all forms of knowledge and therefore it is of utmost importance. And it shouldn't be boring because that is very important, that there should be a, a committed interest in history uh, all the time. What do I mean when I say everything has a history? We have separated history into political history, the activities of rulers, but actually history concerns every human activity. Everything that a person does is an activity and all activities are historical. And if every discipline, every subject, had an opening talk with someone talking about the history of that discipline, the history of that subject, um, it would really make this position very clear. Now, I gave an example yesterday um, of something very simple. Uh, and I talked about how it had a history and we Never think of it as having a history. Um, the objects that surround us, for example, when we eat our food, um, the thal and katori, or the plate in which we eat, the bowl in which we keep uh, liquid food, and that kind of thing. These are all forms that have evolved from early forms. If you go back to the Indus civilization, to the Harappa culture, you will find similar small thalis, small bowls, uh, little dishes on stands, and that kind of thing. These, all of them have a history and come up to the present when they change. And we can tell an early form from a later form because the style changes. There is a fashion in all of this. And the example that I gave uh, the day before yesterday was the example of the chair, what you sit on. You begin by sitting on the ground. You don't need a chair, you don't need anything. You just sit on the ground. Then you introduce a mat and you sit on the mat and the mat gets thicker and thicker as you weave it into something bigger and lumpier so that you're not directly on the ground. And then you move to a low stool, what we sometimes refer to as a piri, four legs and 
maybe four, six inches off the ground. And you sit on that. And then this begins to get bigger. From six inches, it will become 10 inches, it will become 15 inches, it will become 18 inches. And it begins to take on the dimension of a chair. So you add a back and you add arms so that you are comfortable. You can lean back. You don't have to sit up straight all the time. You can lean back. You can put your arms on the arms of, of the chair. And then fashion comes in. Fashion has already come in, of course, but it becomes much stronger at this point. You start decorating your chair. Your, the wooden legs begin to take shape and you make little forms out of them. Uh, the weaving of the seat you put in colored threads and you make colored forms. You put in cushions which are embroidered and have a little scene on them. Um, and it becomes an object which is functional because you sit on it, but it's also an object which is pleasant to look at. It's decorated. It's something that's adorned and you feel nice sitting on it because it's a beautiful object. And then its function also changes from being a chair in a house where everybody sits on it. It becomes bigger and it becomes much more uh, valuable and, and it becomes a throne so that the king sits on it and it takes on a different function. It symbolizes governance, it symbolizes rulership and so on. Now, all of this is part of history in a way. We don't teach it in school, but we assume that the teacher will say to the student, look around you, look at an object or look at an activity and see if you can construct a history of that from the sources that you are familiar with or you, you can inquire about. As in the case of the chair, um, who sat on a mat, who sat on a deer skin, who sat on a tiger skin and that kind of thing. So there is what we call a classification of objects um, which in fact um, tell you something about the history of the object. Where do you find them? You find them in old homes, old houses sometimes. You may also find them through excavation. When you're digging up a site, you may come across bits of a chair. You may certainly come across a lot of pottery. And you begin to give dates to these objects. What was early? What was late? Uh, undecorated legs of chairs were early, decorated legs of chairs were later, then there was a fashion going back to undecorated and so on. So there's a history of the fashion and of the chair, as there is a history of pottery. What the archaeologists speak of, you know that pottery that is called painted grey ware is quite early, and is different from what is called black and red ware. It's a description of the pottery and is different from the northern black polished ware, which is a very sophisticated, shining pottery which was used by the wealthy urban dwellers and so on. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that don't feel that history is only restricted to what is written in the text. History has an extremely important place uh, in daily life. And we are all concerned uh, with trying to find out uh, what the history is of the objects that we're surrounded with. What do we mean by a historical approach? A historical approach is one that draws out the significance of an event. An event happens, a marriage takes place. It can be an ordinary marriage doesn't affect anyone except the two families concerned and their friends and that kind of thing. It can be a royal marriage, which has political implications, which has financial implications, which has social implications. It's much more complicated. And the historian has to distinguish then between a simple activity and a more complicated activity. 
The activities are then put into chronological order. Which came first? Which was earlier and which was later? And why is this important? It's important because it relates to a fundamental question in history, which is what we call the causal connection. The cause, the reason why. Did event A lead to event B? Or did it not? If it didn't, all right, we forget about it. If it did, if there is a link, a seeming link even, you as a historian have to investigate that link and understand what is the link, why is there a link, how was the link made. This is extremely important and these are important questions. Uh, this applies all the way through. The causal connection is a fundamental question in all knowledge. Doesn't matter if you're doing science or you're doing history or you're doing sociology, you are continually having to ask this question of how does it link up? How does it relate? What does it relate to? And in what manner does it relate to something? This really introduces the other question that was asked, which was if history is scientific, then why is perspective so important? Why is an individual perspective important? If history is scientific, it's there. The information is there. The facts are there. The facts speak for themselves, as we said earlier on, as people say, uh, which I disagree with. Um, historians generally disagree with. Uh, similarly, science consists of facts, and therefore the facts are there, and one doesn't have to do anything with them. One does. One has to understand them. First of all, one has to recognize them as facts. Then one has to understand them as facts. And then one has to see this causal linkage that I was talking about. Did fact A lead to fact B? Was fact C the result of fact B? Put it as, as you might. To be scientific, therefore, does not mean that there is no human control over knowledge and that it just carries along and carries along and, 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 and nobody is there to stop it or to turn it in this direction or that. All knowledge, please remember, all knowledge is controlled by human beings. Human beings recognize knowledge, recognize the facts. Human beings put the facts together in a way that gives direction to what they are investigating and human beings recognize the connections. Scientific thought, therefore, consists of questioning the world in which we live. Then the second problem is who asks the questions? It has to be somebody who has a little bit of understanding of the knowledge that is being questioned. And this is where training becomes very important. You cannot read six books of history and then write a book on history if you haven't been trained as a historian. And this is the biggest problem that we professional trained historians face when it comes to history and, uh, and the public. The general public thinks that history is just a collection of facts and information. If you have the information, you write the history. It's not. It's the way in which you analyze it, the way in which you link it, the way in which you put it together, which is extremely important. Therefore, you have to understand the knowledge that you're dealing with. You have to be trained. You have to be trained to ask further questions. Not everybody can ask questions. So if you're going to ask questions, you have to be taught that this is how you ask questions. Not what questions to ask, but how to ask questions, which is very important. And it is through that investigation of asking questions that knowledge advances. So they all have to have trained minds. This is what education is about or should be about. It should be training your mind to think, to ask questions, to put information together and make sense of that 
information. And this is what we call these days the method of research. It is rooted in asking relevant questions. And good historians, for example, everywhere um, are taught how to look at sources, how to examine sources, how to ask questions. And in the process, the perspectives may change. You may find that when you've been asking a whole series of questions of a particular source, something else is emerging. And that something else is beginning to influence the way you're asking the next lot of questions. This may well happen. And if it happens, you have to say that this is how I began to ask a different set of questions. And this is the information which a different set of questions brought to me. And it applies to history because once you get away from the obsession with political history and you start asking questions of other subjects and other topics, um, then it, it becomes extremely important and central. And this happened to history about half a century ago, around the 1960s, 1970s, there was a change from history being just a narrative, a story about the past, to history being an attempt to explain the past. Realize the difference between the two. And in order to explain the past, you ask questions of your sources and these questions were not just historical, but they were also questions taken from the social sciences, because history slowly and gradually became a social science. Social science meaning economics, sociology, anthropology, social, economic, cultural anthropology, demography, archaeology, um, and uh, various environmental studies, et cetera, et cetera. All these disciplines, all these subjects began to be related to history, and history began to, to ask questions taken from these sources as well. And this is, in fact, what we now refer to as interdisciplinary research. It is research that is based not just on one discipline, not just on a historical source, but it means that you read other uh, disciplines as well. Why do you read other <coughs> disciplines? You read them in order to ask fresh new questions of your sources. And that is extremely important, that knowledge it only advances when you ask fresh questions. If you keep asking the same questions and you keep on with the same body of knowledge, you stagnate. It stays put. It's only by asking it questions that it advances further and asking new questions becomes very important. So interdisciplinary research enables you to ask new questions, fresh questions that push your knowledge a little more, advance it a little more. And here, of course, the role of social sciences is terribly important. What are the kinds of questions that historians are now asking? Um, for example, political and administrative history. What were the rules of governing, administration, taxation, and so on? What were the different components of administration? civil administration, revenue administration, the army, all of this goes back to early times. The Mauryan period, Kautilya Arthashastra, is a text which has detailed discussions of this administration, which administrators today should be reading because it is still relevant to a lot of the work they're doing. Which levels of society are we talking about? since levels differ. Are we talking about the elite, the ruling group, the aristocracy, uh, the top administration, the heads of religious institutions, all very powerful, all very wealthy? Or are, are we talking about others with different occupations, artisans, traders, peasants, 
people who are potters and weavers and people who are scavengers, people who are hunters and gatherers and that kind of thing, the non-elites. Remember, society consists of both groups and the good historian should be able to correlate in a particular period that he or she is writing about. They should be able to correlate the elite groups with the non-elite groups and talk about occupations all the way down from the top to the lower levels. What were the different economic activities that people carried on? Um, what were the rules that they observed? The rules for marriage, for example, who you can marry and who you can't marry. Can you marry your cousin? Can you marry your cross cousin, Mamu Kilarki? Can you uh, can you marry across castes? Why not? And if you can't, please explain why you can't. And if you can, then explain what happens when you can. So these are important. Property holdings, inheritance, these change according to region, according to religion, according to ethnic community, the different property relations. Why are they different? What are the reasons for this difference? Can they all be brought together into one as we are trying to do with talk about uh, a uniform civil code, which has immense problems because all these questions have to be answered. You can't just impose a new code. You have to correlate all these questions. What languages did people speak? And were there differences between the languages spoken by the elite groups, the top classes, and the languages spoken by the lower groups? In olden times, for example, it's clear from the literature that we have that Sanskrit was spoken by men of the upper castes. Men of the lower castes and women all spoke Prakrit. Prakrit was considered an inferior language. Now this is in itself a commentary on social relations between men and women in that society. Men spoke the superior language, women spoke the inferior language. Who worshipped which deity? This also is extremely important because deities also are graded uh, in many ways and uh, some people worship what we call the classical deities, Vishnu, Shiva, Durga, Shakti, so on. Others worship tribal deities or local deities with different names, different forms, different rituals of worship. This, there is a social distinction again, and religion is full of social distinctions. And you have to learn as historians or interested in history, you have to learn to recognize these distinctions as well. There's your second section, I think. No? Have I covered it? Yes, very nicely and elaborately. Uh, do you have the energy to take one question from our student who is now teaching in a school? Mm -hmm. Just one. Uh, Deepika, I invite her. She was our student. She studied history at Delhi University. And now she's teaching in a school at Lucknow. So she share your experiences and ask for some guidance. Deepika, please. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, good evening, ma'am. It is a great honor listening to you speak. And um, I just wanted to share my experience in school that when I was uh, going to teach students in this valley about Indus Valley civilization, so my headmaster asked me to incorporate certain clips from the movie Mohan Judaro, the recent movie, and he asked me to incorporate clips. Along with that, he asked me to um, compare the theory, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution with uh, Vishnu's 10 avatars and to make the class interesting for the students. So in that context, I uh, would like to know what can be done as a teacher to make students understand this difference. First of all, you have to do something which you can't do, <coughs> which is to explain to your headmaster that there is a difference between history 
and between these public presentations, that the two should not be confused. History is to be taught in class. The public presentations can be made in recreational periods outside class, clearly stating that these are creations which people have made up. I mean, the, the, so the, the film on Mohinjo Daro is made up. It's not historical. And that this is not to be confused with the history that you're being taught in class. This is only to make you a little more interested in that history. But please do not quote this as history. This has to be very, very strongly ingrained. And this is precisely what I mean. This is a lovely example of the way in which uh, the public is trying to intervene in history via all kinds of other media like politics and social media and so on uh, to change the way in which history is perceived and to be taught, to, in a sense, reduce the value of history by making it into fantasy. This is really what's happening. You're taking away from the rationality and, and the professional science of the subject, and you're bringing in fantasy and imagination and so on, and you're diluting it. Now, that is something which no educational institution should be doing. So I think that if you can't speak to the headmaster, which obviously you can't do because you lose your job, you can at least make it clear to the students that this is not history as history. This is simply a little fantasy which somebody has and has made a film and is, you know, uh, playing around with these ideas. Similarly with the, the Dasartar, the point, of course, is that if you're trying to prove that this is the theory of evolution and therefore predates Darwin by many, many centuries, where is the discussion on this in the Sanskrit texts? There is no discussion on this being a theory of evolution. A. B. The Dasartar, as we have them now, is from certain texts. There are other texts that have 20 of Dars. There are other texts that have different of ours. What are you going to do with them? How are you going to fit them in if you're going to prove, if you're going to argue that this is a theory of evolution? And a theory of evolution is based on a rational analysis of different species of living beings as they go on evolving. Where in Sanskrit literature do you have a discussion of this? You don't. Therefore, this is a very lively, imaginative, way of looking at the theory of incarnation, but not of evolution. Thank you, ma'am. Any other question? One question? Abhinash, Kurdi, Pakash. Um, I request my colleague, Dr. Ringole, to express gratitude, the gratitude on part of our department. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Romila, ma'am. I just want to quote one uh, very good uh, thought of uh, uh, one of the historian uh, from Japan. Uh, his name is... Uh, uh, Daisaku Ikeda, um, he says, I quote, being a, being a born human does not make a one human being. Don't we really only become a human being when we make a tenacious effort to live as a human being? That's why education is so important. We need a human education to being a human being. Hmm. Uh, along with that, I just want to uh, give one more quote over here, which has given by Arnold Tobey, British historian, I quote, there is no book in the world that is so thrilling, stirring, and inspiring as the Upanishad. So it's a very good combination. You explain so well the history, uh, the importance of history as a teacher's life, and how this history uh, have a journey from Vedic period till uh, 21st century. So it's a combo of culture, thinking process of the people who are uh, living that culture, and along with that, how they construct their knowledge. Thank you so much for your so lively and intellectual uh, treat to all of us. Thank you.
I uh, I'm Minakshi and uh, Dr. Latika Gupta. We are uh, giving a lots of gratitude for your this talk, behalf of CIE and our all BA students. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. It was it was uh, it's a good experience. Thank you. Thank you, Megaji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Keep safe. Yeah. Enjoy the yes, yeah. It's right. We hope to plan a few more sessions like this. Yes, we'll keep tiring you out. <laughs> no doubt about it. Not in a hurry. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.